JSON, JavaScript Objects Notation, properly pronounced JSON. JSON. And was almost called Jismal. Jismal. <laughs> Jismal. Am I like four years old? It's funny. It's the canonical information interchange that we use on the internet today. It's used in Twitter. It's used on Facebook. It's used on YouTube. It's used on Netflix. It's used on Twitch. It's used everywhere. See, if I were to subscribe to say the Primogen and I press subscribe, you'll see right here that we did send off and boom, Jason is used as the response to update the UI. Why don't you give it a try? <laughs> see if your network tab shows Jason when you subscribe to me. But here's the thing about Jismal, sorry, Jason, is that it is slow. It is incredibly slow. It is outlandishly slow. And yes, no, I get it. XML is worse, but not by that much. So today I am going to show you how Jason works and even more importantly, why it's slow. So what is JSON? Well, imagine this guy right here wants to communicate to Twitch well, via the cloud. The thing about the cloud is that it can only take in zeros or ones. You know, that's why you have this rating like megabits or gigabits per second. That effectively means how many zeros and ones it can send per second. A million zeros and ones per second would be one megabit per second. So if we look at this object right here, we can't just send this across the wire, right? The wire does not understand an object. It understands zeros and ones. That is why we would take something like this and turn it into a string because a string is really just a series of bytes and bytes are eight bits. We can send those across the wire. Of course, when you JSON stringify them, it actually looks a lot like that JavaScript right above. That is why it's called JavaScript object notation because it literally is JavaScript. We can actually just simply jump up here and go const b equals this and it's just valid javascript but the thing that is kind of interesting about javascript object notation or json or jismal it was almost jismal is that every time it has to specify the key and the value it, it is in the most verbose way possible because it the schema is contained within the data that means to represent this single byte object right here this kind of this type discriminator, you actually need to have about nine bytes to represent that one byte, which of course is four for the word type, two for the quotes, one for the colon, and of course one for the comma. Timestamps are equally terrible. A timestamp can be represented with eight bytes, but this right here actually is represented with 27 bytes because every single number takes a byte. So this right here, these last ones right here, is how much it should take overall. But instead, you have all that extra fluff on the end. It's also not that great when it comes to complex types like this one. You have extra two bytes for, you know, the brackets on the end, and then each number has to be represented by its length in bytes. So let's just say these were each one byte. You could tightly pack this as two bytes, and it would be a two byte array. But instead, it's going to take eight bytes to represent the exact same piece of information, not to mention the key and the quotes and the colon on this side. And if there was more data, there would be an extra comma. I know you're sitting there thinking, eh, it's just bytes. This can't be that big of a deal. I'm in megabytes. I'm in gigabytes. There's a lot more that happens with JSON than just simply how many bytes are transferred across the wire. Remember, when you JSON parse something, it needs to take this, create the key, create the value, put that in a newly constructed object, go to the next one, parse out the key, parse out the value, put that into an object or create intermediate objects if needed. It has to do this one at a time as it goes through your JSON type. And if you're ever curious about how this works, here you go on json.org, you can actually see all the flow diagrams that do happen to be able to parse out every single value. And as you can see, it's, a, it's quite a bit of work right here. It has to read it one byte at a time. Also, if you look at this thing right here, this is the reason right here why a trailing comma breaks your package.json every time. If they would have just put an extra one right here, we would have been so good. But no, 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 no. JSON does not like those trailing commas. All right, so let's talk about an alternative encoding. So I just moved this over to Rust so you can kind of see this right here. This is called an enum. This is technically a sum type. I have a rating which has an inner object or the type inside of it is a eight byte for a timestamp plus one byte for the data. So you could imagine that I would need one byte for the type of enum that I'm going to have. Plus, I'm going to need eight bytes to represent the timestamp. Plus, I'm going to need another one byte to represent that piece of data right here. And of course, the coordinate is going to be the exact same thing, except for I'm going to need two bytes at the end to represent these two bytes in an array. 
And so to be able to represent the exact same information, I only need about 10 or 11 bytes. Whereas on the other side, it's around 50 bytes to represent the same thing. So about a 5x saving in size. So that's kind of like the overall reason why JSON is used and of course why it is not that great, right? But there's actually more to it. And so I wanna show you a little experiment I made just to really test how fast or how slow JSON is. And of course, you know what that means. If we're doing experiments and we're going blazingly fast, we need to do something. We need to change this attire. Oh, it's science time. All right, so this is the simple test. So first, this is the server. This is a very important part. I'm just creating a raw TCP server in which people can make TCP connections to. With that, the message is gonna look a little something like this. The first byte of the message will be the length of what is going to be in the message. The next will be the stringified, say, representation of the object using JSON or the Deku encoding. Of course, Deku encoding is named after Zelda Ocarina of Time, and it is effectively just that simple binary representation that we talked about. I have to do a bit of annotation, blah, blah, blah. And on the Rust side, I can create these really small objects instead of JSON encoding. So that means in JavaScript, I had to write a Deku deserializer. So you can see right here, I actually only read out one byte because the data in my messages is effectively a type and byte. I use the type as the function to call right here. So that who am I function is called right here if the first byte is a who am I byte. And of course, I have to be able to read all this data out of the stream of data coming in from the TCP socket. So I just simply get the parse call. And then after that, I actually parse out the message and then send it on to the program. If it's just JSON, I do the exact same thing. I read out the length of this message right here. And then I simply do a simple subarray into this buffer and then to string it and then parse it. And as you can see here, I don't do anything with the object. I just simply let go of it right away. I don't even try to hold on to these newly parsed items. I'm just saying how fast can this server handle parsing. And of course, I took the time to write a client in Rust. I spawn about 100 threads sending things as fast as possible. And I send them in chunks of 1,000, I think, at a time. And I either serialize them in JSON or I serialize them using Deku. And of course, I only do the serialization once, of course, at the top of the program. The rest of the time, I'm just sending copies of that data over and over again. So maximum, blazingly fast. All right, so let's just try the experiment out. So I have the JSON server running right here. The server is bound. It's ready to rock. I'm going to jump over and do I, the, the Rust client saying, hey, encode your things via JSON. And I'm going to send it as fast as possible. And the server is going to run for 10 seconds of received messages and then stop and tell me how many objects per millisecond can be created. All right, give it a second. I did say 10 seconds. You know, it has to run for a little bit. And there you go. It ran for 10 seconds. It created a lot of objects. And so that's about 1,665 objects per millisecond JSON can create. Now remember, we don't hold on to anything. We don't do anything special. We just let it run. All right, so let's run the Deku server. Let's jump over here and run the Deku client. Now remember, the JSON server did about 1,665 objects per millisecond, whereas the Deku one did about 24,000 objects per second. So over 10x improvement. That is significantly faster. So what I don't want you to do is just go out there and just convert right away to binary. Do some research, see how much requests are going on, make sure you kind of, you know, profile your server, do an experiment, see what happens to your server. Because remember, JSON is easy. JSON is a very simple, you know, algorithm. It's very simple to see the output. It's very simple to inspect. Whereas these binary encodings can be quite difficult to work with. And versioning is not that easy. Just like versioning in JSON also is not easy. Your client just gets data that it can't understand. That's the only difference is that the schema is within the JSON, whereas you're assumed to know the schema when it comes to these binary protocols. It's not a protocol. It's really an encoding. If you think about it, it's a serialization and deserialization. And so is JSON slow? Absolutely. It's just horrifyingly slow. Would the world be a better place if we never used JSON? Probably. I mean, we'd probably be using half the servers that we're using today on Earth if we just got rid of all that crappy JSON encoding. Again, this is the second kind of deep dive, more intense video on something. If you like this, let me know down below. Show me those algorithmic signals. Of course, subscribe to the channel, blah, 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 blah. You get the idea because if you don't do it, I don't. 
don't know that you like this. I think that you hate it. And I won't do it even though I like it. And of course, everything that we developed today, even the results and everything, we're all done live on Twitch. So if you want to come check it out, come check it out. The name is the Scienceogen. Jizzle. I can't believe, I can't believe it was almost called Jizzle. Like, how much better would life have been if it was called Jizzle?